Hello Matrix and welcome to our series of videos on the perfect market. In today's lesson we will be focusing on how the price is determined for the individual producer in a perfect market. We will be using graphs and explanations and this is a popular examination question and can be examined in section B as an 8 market. Alternatively in section C it can be examined as an additional part to the essay. Let's kick off today's lesson by unpacking the graphs. You will notice that I have two graphs drawn alongside each other and not below each other. There is a very specific reason why we draw these graphs alongside each other and not below each other and I am going to be getting into that in a bit. I'm going to start off my graphs with assigning them headings. Okay, My graph on my left hand side is always known as the industry graph. So let me just fold that in and I will be defining it in a second. And my graph on the right hand side is always known as the individual producer. So the individual producer. The industry grade 12s refers to all businesses producing a particular good or service in a market. Whereas the individual producer refers to one particular business within that industry. So when we talk about the banking industry, we are referring to all the banks that make up that particular market. But if we refer to one particular branch, let's just say we're talking about Absa Woodstock branch or Capitec Kenilworth Center branch, that would refer to an individual producer. So now that we have headings on our graphs, let's continue unpacking them. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to assign labels to our axes. So this is my price axes. You could, of course, abbreviate this to P and Q, but I'm just filling them out in four. So that's naught, price, and quantity. You could, of course, call them P and Q. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start filling in our curves. I'm going to start with my demand curve. So let me just fill that in. Let me label it D, D. And then I'm going to fill in my supply curve. And I'm going to label that S, S. Let's just recap some of um, the factual information about our curves. The demand curve has got a negative gradient because it slopes from top left. To bottom right. It is based on the hypothesis that when prices are high, quantity demand will be low, and when prices are low, quantity demand is high. Our supply curve, on the other hand, has got a positive gradient. It slopes from top right to bottom left, and it is based on the hypothesis that when prices are high, quantity supply will be high, and when prices are low, the quantity supply will be low. Where my demand and my supply curve intersect, in other words, at that point there, that is known as my equilibrium point, grade 12s. From my equilibrium point, I am able to determine my equilibrium price, which I'm going to call P1, and my equilibrium quantity, which I'm going to call Q1. Now you have to take very careful note of the following. The individual producer grade 12s is known as a price taker. I'm going to write that term down, price taker. And the reason why the individual producer is known as a price taker is because the individual producer adopts this price that was formulated through the interaction of demand and supply. So this price of P1 is the price that the individual producer will charge. The individual producer does not decide on their prices independently. And that is because he is a price taker. In the imperfect market, producers are price makers because they decide on their prices independently. But in the perfect market, the individual producer will always be a price taker. So what I'm literally going to do, grade 12s, is I'm going to take my ruler and I'm going to extend that price that was formulated through the interaction of demand and supply. And that is the price that the individual producer will now adopt. So that's his price, P1. 
and this is his demand curve. You will notice, grade 12, that the demand curve is perfectly elastic. The reason why the demand curve is perfectly elastic is because the price stays the same irrespective of the quantity being demanded, hence it being perfectly elastic. On my next slide, I've got it all neatly typed up for you. Let's just recap it once more. In a perfect market, the price of goods and services are determined by the interaction of demand and supply, demand and supply. D, D refers to my demand curve, S, S refers to my supply curve, where they intersect the equilibrium point, price and quantity is formulated. Equilibrium point, price and quantity. This is the market price that the individual producer will adopt because they are price takers. Extending this price from the industry graph to the individual producer clearly indicates that the individual producer is a price taker. So all we're going to do is we're simply going to extend that price and that is the price that the individual producer will charge. Please note again the demand curve which is perfectly elastic and that is because the price stays the same irrespective of the quantity being demanded. The next thing that we're going to be examining is why will the producer not choose to charge a higher price? Alternatively, a lower price. Let's start off with a higher price. Remember grade 12s that in the perfect market there are many many suppliers. That's really what sets the perfect market apart from the imperfect market. So if one supplier decides to charge a higher price of P2, there are so many other suppliers that the consumer can choose from that they will simply seek out another supplier who is charging the price of P1. It is therefore not feasible for the producer to charge a higher price because he could possibly lose out on potential business because consumers will seek out alternative producers charging the lower price of P1. Let's look at the lower price of P3. If the producer decided to decrease his price from P1 to P3, the producer could possibly lose out on potential income and possibly even run at a loss. It is therefore not feasible for the producer to charge a lower price because from a financial point of view, it just does not make sense. If he charges the lower price, he will be making less income, less profit and therefore possibly even run at a loss. So to recap, at a higher price of P2, consumers will simply choose to purchase from the lower priced suppliers of P1. If producers choose to drop the price to P3, the suppliers will make far less profit or possibly even run at a loss. P1 is therefore the best price for the supplier to charge. We are now going to be examining the revenue curves. Let's start off with the definitions. Total revenue refers to all the income that has been earned from the sale of goods and services. Our marginal revenue refers to the additional income that has been earned when an additional unit is sold. And the average revenue, grade 12s, refers to the income that is earned per unit. In order to calculate our revenues, we would say total revenue refers to quantity times by price. Our marginal revenue refers to our change in the total revenue divided by the change in the quantity. And for our average revenue, we would simply say total revenue divided by the quantity. So let's fill in our table. Don't forget they're all in rands. So for total revenue, we're going to say 30 times 1, which is 30. 30 times 2, which is 60. 30 times 3, which is 90. 30 times 4, which is 120 and 30 times 5, which is 150. For our marginal revenue, we're going to look at the change in our total revenue and divide it by the change in our quantity. So 30 divided by 1 is 30. 60 minus 30 is 30, divided by 1, which is 30. 90 minus 60 is 30, divided by 1, which is 30. 120 minus 90 is 30, divided by 1, which is 30. 
and then 150 minus 30 is 30 divided by 1 which is 30. Let's look at our average revenue. We're going to say our total revenue divided by our quantity. So 30 divided by 1 is 30. 60 divided by 2 is 30. 90 divided by 3 is 30. 120 divided by 4 is 30. And 150 divided by 5 is 30. We can clearly see grade 12s that our marginal revenue is exactly the same as our average revenue. And the reason for that, grade 12 is because our price remained the same, irrespective of the quantity that was being demanded, hence it being perfectly elastic. So let's plot this in. Okay, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Okay, draw it in and label it. D is equal to AR, which is equal to MR. I refer to this as the DAM rule. The DAM rule, grade 12, says that demand is equal to average revenue, which is also equal to marginal revenue. Once again, this curve is perfectly elastic because the price remains the same irrespective of the quantity being demanded. You should now be able to draw and discuss how the price is formulated within the perfect market and you should also understand why the average revenue curve is the same as the marginal revenue curve. Thank you very much. Check out the video description below for practice questions from our study guides. If you found this video useful, give it a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new episodes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook to stay on top of the latest TAS news and launches. So that's it for now from the Answer Series, your key to exam success.